<laughs> so we're going to be recording the session today um, and we'll have it up for people who are unregistered as well. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce a Dr. Jill Shanehouse, who opened the Insight Naturopathic Clinic located in Midtown in Toronto in 2004. Dr. Shanehouse's practice is exclusive to adjunctive cancer care, and she strives to help patients improve their clinical outcomes and quality of life using an evidence-based approach to care. Dr. Shane House is a clinic fa clinical faculty member for many years at the Robert Shad Naturopathic Teaching Clinic, during which she helped begin the Adjunctive Cancer Care Program and now the Integrative Cancer Care Center. Uh, I, I, there's a lot more that Dr. Jill, uh, Shane House has done, but I'm going to leave it there because we have a packed presentation. We'll also be sharing the slides today, too. Um, so we will share that after the, the group. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Katie, I'm just going to open this up. So happy to be here today. I love Gildo's Club and I'm used to presenting in that amazing little living room. And this is a much bigger group, but I'm very excited to be here. So thanks so much for having me. So as Katie sort of did a rundown of my bio, so I don't really need to read this all out to you, but this is just a little bit about me and, and what, I, what I do and what I've done. Um, Somebody had asked about how to find a naturopathic doctor, um, especially one that has a practice focus, we'll call it a practice focus because the province of Ontario and actually most provinces of Canada do not recognize any specialty certificates for naturopathic doctors. So I've given you some links here and if you get these slides, you can just click on these links. The first one here is the Oncology Association of Naturopathic Physicians directory. Um, and I just sort of saved the link there specific to Ontario, assuming everybody is in Ontario. And if you're not, you can select another province. The second link is specific to FABNO, which stands for Fellow of the American Board of Naturopathic Oncology. And this is the highest standard of training and certification in naturopathic cancer care. Now, most naturopathic doctors who have a practice focus in oncology or in private practice were unfortunately not in the hospital system. That would be an amazing goal if that ever does happen. There's also a teaching clinic at the Robert Shad Naturopathic Clinic. Um, it's now called the Integrative Cancer Center. It used to be called the Adjunctive Cancer Care Program. So they've just sort of switched the program around a little bit, how it runs and, um, and, and, and in terms of the fees there, because it is a teaching clinic, it's a little bit more affordable and um, it's a great program. You end up seeing an intern and a licensed ND that has experience and that board certification in naturopathic cancer care. So I just wanted to raise the question, what percentage of patients undergoing conventional therapy do you think are using some form of complementary and alternative medicine? Do you think it's 10% or less? 20 to 50% or 60 to 90%. I think you were going to launch the poll. We'll just so wait just a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, give everyone a few more seconds. And then we're going to give you three more seconds. So please get your answers in. We almost have 100% uh, participation. So that's great. Great. Okay. I'm going to cancel. I'm going to end the poll now. I'll share the results. Okay. Interesting. So I'm going to close this up. So most people thought it was actually not the correct one, which is it was the last one. It was 60 to 90%. Um, and this is actually uh, recorded data that was published in one, the Journal of Clinical Oncology, uh, reporting that 68.7% of patients surveyed had used at least one CAM therapy. And CAM is that broad term, complementary alternative medicine that refers to anything from prayer, meditation, yoga, acupuncture, supplements, herbs. Um, and another study in the American Journal of Oncology reported 81% of radiotherapy patients using dietary supplements. So it's a very large percentage. So you might ask yourself, why don't naturopathic doctors work in the hospital in an integrated model? I'm not sure, but 
it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a dream to actually bridge the gap. And um, that's actually why I started my program at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, um, trying to educate naturopathic interns, but also educating uh, the staff at the hospital as well, so that they could see what we do. Now, we have a bit of a problem with this percentage of patients who are taking any type of complementary and alternative medicine. The majority of patients do not disclose that they're taking vitamins or other supplements. And the reason why is because most patients, when they report that they're taking something that's a supplement or a natural health product, they're told, don't take anything. Don't take anything during your treatment. And so I think there's a bit of fear there from the patient's perspective that they're going to be told, don't take anything. So I'm just not going to tell them what I'm taking. Now, is that a good idea? Probably not, because we could get into some herb drug or nutrient drug interactions. When you see a naturopathic doctor who provides supportive cancer care, these are our goals. I've sort of summarized them here for you to see. We want to provide safe and effective integrative care. We want to avoid those interactions. And I shouldn't really make this specifically about herb drug or nutrient drug, but also what about radiotherapy if you're having that? And what about surgery? Like we have to be careful around these other uh, types of treatments. We want to keep patients healthy enough to complete their course of care as prescribed by their medical team. We always review diet and make recommendations. We want to answer any questions that patients might have and, and just integrate it all together. And one of, well, two of the biggest goals we have are prevention of recurrence after treatment or prevention of a primary diagnosis in a susceptible individual who may have a genetic disorder that predisposes them to a specific type of cancer. What don't we do? We do not provide an alternative to standard care. I think there's quite a misconception, not in the general population, but I think some patients really come to us hoping that we're going to provide for that patient an alternative standard, uh, an alternative to the standard of care. And there really isn't an alternative to the standard of conventional care. So we really support, integrate, we try to put it all together and bridge that gap. When you come in for an initial consult with a naturopathic doctor, specifically for oncology, you're looking at about a one and a half to two hour appointment. And that's because we really wanna go through your entire health history, any symptoms you might be experiencing, any concerns you might have, go over all of the conventional therapy regimen and make sure that you understand it. Go through any other pre post meds medications you might be on or medications for other comorbid conditions. And we look at the supplements or herbs or anything that you might be on that's a natural health product in great detail. We look at the brands, we wanna look at the doses. Some people are taking four different things that have a little bit of vitamin D, but all of those you know, little amounts of vitamin D can add up. So we just wanna make sure that what you're on is safe. And, and so we'll assess everything in great detail. So with the virtual consults these days, we've just been having People either go to their cupboard and put everything on the counter and we look at the fronts and we look at the backs or some patients will send me a picture of the front label and the back label of their products. We also look at lab tests, surgical reports, pathology reports, any imaging. The easiest way to do this with, with a naturopath is to share the patient portal access on something such as MyUHN or MyChart. Those have made it really easy to just put it all together. And, and I can also review that or another ND could, could review that before the appointment and be prepared. Somebody had asked uh, prior to the session, the scope of practice of a naturopathic doctor. So I just wanted to summarize what is included in the training of an ND in Canada. So we do a lot of counseling and nutrition, diet and exercise, lifestyle, uh, supplement prescription, herbal and botanical medicine, that can be in the form of tinctures or teas, acupuncture and Chinese medicine. IV therapy is really only if that ND is certified. So that's a separate certification from the core curriculum of an ND. And we are trained in homeopathy and orthopedic manipulation. I find there are some NDs that do a lot of that and some that really don't do a lot of it. I don't do a lot of, of that last, uh, those last two points there. I also wanted to review today the most common things that I'm asked about as a naturopathic doctor who's been doing this for 17 plus years. So I wanted to start off with antioxidants and superfoods. So I've sort of outlined the, the main points here. 
Now there's a difference between antioxidants in your food versus the therapeutic dosage and supplements. And this is pretty important to, to consider a long time ago, some of the cancer centers were actually telling patients, you know, don't eat an antioxidant rich diet during your treatment, which didn't really make a lot of sense, but I think they were just concerned that people would overdo it. But in general, antioxidants such as, and then we're talking supplements, so vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, selenium, alpha lipoic acid, green tea extract, those are sort of no-nos because they're pretty potent antioxidants. And there's more, this is just a pretty general list. Um, we don't use those in supplement form during any type of chemotherapy or radiation. And that's because of the potential for the two therapies to butt heads, chemotherapy radiation being very pro-oxidative and those supplements being very anti-oxidative and free radical scavenging. So we don't wanna protect all of the cells too much during therapy. We wanna do it to a certain extent, but not with these specific supplements because we do have some studies proving that some of these supplements could negate or hinder the efficacy of these therapies. So which superfoods are actually super? You might recognize some of these are some matcha green tea, wheatgrass, and turmeric, of which the active constituent is actually called curcumin, and I'll go into that in a little bit of detail in a minute. Wheatgrass is a great source of chlorophyll, and there's actually a study showing that patients with breast cancer who took wheatgrass, a lot of wheatgrass, 60 mils of wheatgrass, actually help to support their blood counts and their bone marrow, bone marrow's ability to produce cells during treatment versus those who didn't. Kind of neat. And the reason why is chlorophyll is a very similar chemical shape to hemoglobin. And the only difference really is that they're bound to different things. One's bound, chlor, plant chlorophyll is bound to magnesium and chlorophyll, or sorry, hemoglobin is bound to an iron molecule. So very similar. And if you take in more chlorophyll in the form of greens, maybe wheatgrass or powders, you can actually help with the synthesis of hemoglobin. And there's that study that proved that. So that's just sort of interesting. So I thought I'd bring that to your attention. Some other superfoods that are commonly consumed or asked about sprouts and microgreens. A lot of people are into sprouting their own sprouts. They've got tables full of sprouting trays. The, ma the, the magical ingredient in sprouts or the stem cell targeting constituent is called sulforaphane. And this constituent is in all of your cruciferous veggies, but it's more concentrated in your sprouts and your microgreens. And so what, what happens when you consume a lot of the sulforaphane is there's, there have been some early studies showing that that constituent may actually help to target the cancer stem cell or stem cell before it, is, before it becomes a problem cell, problematic cell. Another uh, superfood constituent, which is one I'm, I'm often asked about, can I drink red wine? That's a very, you know, it's, is it the best alcohol if there's a good alcohol to have? And unfortunately, a lot of studies with various primary malignancies show that drinking alcohol is probably not a good thing. But resveratrol is in red grape skins. Um, and when you consume it in, in, in the form of fruit, blueberry skins, grapes, uh, cocoa, it, it might be a good thing. Again, there's some cell line evidence to support its use as a food. Another uh, phytonutrient, lycopene, is in cooked tomato products. It's one of the only uh, nutrients that is better absorbed when you cook the, the fruit or vegetable that it's coming from. And turmeric, as the picture showed there, that was a, a, a root and some powdered turmeric. So it's the really orangey uh, rhizome. We have to be quite cautious with turmeric when it's being taken in large amounts concurrent with therapy. And curcumin, which is the active constituent in a lot of other, uh, a lot of drugs are metabolized through this complex in the liver called the CYP450 complex. And this constituent actually affects something called CYP384. Um, dietary turmeric isn't likely to interact in a lot of, uh, in, in low amounts, um, but you do have to be careful with some drugs. I did highlight one here, that cyclophosphamide chemotherapy. One study showed that high dose of turmeric or curcumin could reduce the efficacy of the drug. So that's obviously something that we wanna be really careful with. 
uh, green tea, sencha and matcha, which are the two Japanese green teas, they contain something called EGCG. This is a catechin, that's the active constituent. And it's been studied in a variety of different primary cancers to be very helpful. You need to drink a lot of it to actually interact with any kind of treatment. So generally we'll just say to someone, don't have more than two cups a day. If it's matcha, maybe we leave it at one because matcha powder is quite concentrated um, in that catechin, that EGCG. A few more just to review here. Uh, dandelion root has gotten a lot of attention um, over the last, I'd say probably about decade now. Um, some early evidence with chronic leukemias and melanoma. It might be helpful if it's taken as an additional supplement. It's never to be used as a standalone agent. Pomegranate has quite a lot of evidence for its use. It might improve efficacy of certain drugs like tamoxifen. But we also have to be careful that it doesn't reduce the efficacy of a drug because it's pushing or inhibiting the metabolism of a drug. So there is that there. In the diet though, it's something that can typically be consumed. In the fruit form, the juice is another story. It's more of a concentrate. So I've just summarized some things that pomegranate uh, might do. Chaga is another uh, superfood that I'm asked about a lot. It actually grows fairly locally, but, but not right in Toronto. If you go north of the city into sort of Muskoka region, there's a lot of birch trees. And if you look at the birch trees closely, if you see a large black sort of fungating mass on the trunk, and if you have a little ax and you hack it open and you see some bright orange internal component to that black thing, that's um, chaga mushroom. It's kind of like, um, it, it's more like bark than a spongy mushroom. It's got immune enhancing effects. Um, it can be taken as a tea. And some of my patients do take it during their treatment. It really depends on their blood counts. In high doses, even the tea might cause a bit of an anticoagulant or blood thinning effect. So we have to be careful with that one as well. But it does have some beneficial effects on the uh, counts during, during treatment. Soursop or graviola is another one I'm frequently asked about. It's available in a lot of health food stores. Sometimes the tea is taken. Um, as part of a patient's culture. There's some cell line info, not a lot of information on uh, combining with other therapies though. And then one that's actually from Bracebridge, Ontario, uh, SEAC T is another one I'm asked about a lot. And this is basically an alterative formula. Alterative is, is sort of a fancy word for blood cleansing. It's not something I typically recommend during treatment, uh, but afterwards it, it might be a, a helpful additional thing for patients to put into their lifestyle. So that was just sort of an overview of a lot of the superfoods I'm asked about on a regular basis or fairly regular basis. I'm also asked a lot about diet. You know, what's the specific diet I should eat? Give me a plan, tell me what I should eat. And there's a lot of, you know, conversations about vegan, plant-based, raw diets, ketogenic. And at the hospital, patients are often quite frustrated when they come to see me because they're told it doesn't matter what you eat, eat whatever you want. They're very frequently told that at least, not all the time, but most of the time. We make some basic dietary recommendations. Um, I wanna make sure that my patients are not having a lot of simple sugars in their diet or simple carbohydrates. So those are things like white bread, white rice, white potatoes, um, unless they're on a very special diet because of compromised digestion. Um, we wanna improve their consumption of antioxidant rich foods in general, so plants. Um, we do wanna make sure that a large portion of their diet is coming from plant-based foods. And we want to make sure that they're eating enough protein and that they're getting healthy fat in their diet. That means improving the omega-3 to 6 ratio. Omega-3s are very anti-inflammatory. Omega-6s are more pro-inflammatory. But it's important to know that to date, there's, there's really no perfect diet for any given malignancy. And so sometimes it just comes down to what is best for that specific patient. Um, some research that is emerging, I'll give you a couple of examples or one good example, uh, GBM, glioblastoma multiforme, which is a grade four class brain tumor. There is some evidence emerging for ketogenic diet concurrently used, so adjunctive to chemo radiotherapy, uh, that that might improve overall outcome. So that is sort of more of a specific thing that's, that's, um, that's starting to emerge in the literature. 
A lot of my patients ask about fasting protocols because um, this is a bit of a hot topic on discussion boards. Um, there are various fasting protocols that are, again, in the early stages of being studied, anywhere from like a 16-hour fast period to a 48-hour fasting period. Um, sometimes compliance to these longer protocols are not great because that's a long time to go without food. And a lot of these protocols are during treatment, meant to improve tolerance to chemotherapy and improve outcome. We do know that fasting in general can improve insulin sensitivity and it can reduce circulating glucose and it can improve something called IGF-1, which stands for insulin-like growth factor one. These are all good things. Like we want to improve this whole sugar and insulin picture and we want to reduce this insulin-like growth factor one. Um, so based on uh, like on a case by case basis, I might assess a patient and determine whether I think they might be a good candidate for any sort of fasting, uh, but it's not completely mainstream to every patient. So I just wanted to sort of outline some of these, some of these special diets that people ask, ask about and, and just sort of go over the most, the key points. So keto is very high fat. When I say very high fat, it is 70% of total calories from fat and then moderate protein and very low, less than 5% total calories from carbohydrates. So we know that, and, and I sourced the, as I said, the study here, just in case anybody was interested to look at that study for gliomas um, in terms of this diet helping with that, the, that particular primary. There's also some early literature for pancreatic cancer and lung cancer. But as I mentioned before, it's a very hard diet to make a lifestyle um, out of it's it's and it's it's just not a lot of choice it's very it's very limited in terms of what you can eat and very very high fat so not everybody can tolerate it the vegetarian diet historically there has been a lot of prevention of primary cancer study on things like the mediterranean diet were high amount of plants consumed, fruits, vegetables, eating the rainbow, we know this. So I would say that we have a lot of evidence to not be completely vegan or vegetarian, um, but to really increase our consumption of, of plants. And that's because, that's for a lot of reasons. We know that mostly plant-based diets can offer protection against cardiovascular disease, but also type two diabetes and hypertension. And some of these, conditions such as type 2 diabetes increase our risk of developing a cancer. And certainly post-diagnosis and the prevention of recurrence, we really want to make sure that we are getting more of these antioxidant-rich foods and these blood sugar stabilizing foods as well. So just eating really clean, simple foods is, is what I usually will tell my patients. The other really really important thing to consider with more plants is you're consuming more fiber. And fiber content really helps to contribute to better gut health, which is a very commonly discussed thing after treatment, gut health. Many patients experience altered gut health post-treatment. Their microbiome, which is the good bacteria that live in their gut are all messed up. And so they often will complain about symptoms of bloating um, or just a change in their bowel movements in terms of frequency and consistency and just how, how well they can digest things. So eating fiber and soluble fibers, but lots of vegetables and certain fruits can really impact that uh, gut microbiome. We wanna make sure that we're getting fuel. Fiber is fuel for the bacteria that live inside the gut. I sort of compare this to a fish tank. If you put fish in a fish tank, but you don't feed them, the fish aren't going to survive. So in order to, if you're taking probiotics or you're eating fermented foods, which I'll talk about um, in a few minutes, is you need to fuel, you need to provide fuel for those bacteria to live there. So we'll often assess a patient's diet post-treatment. Some, some people have just totally, you know, they eat what they can during treatment and it's been a very bland diet of pasta and bread and rice, the things that we don't really want to see a huge amount of in the diet, but we'll assess the diet, see what the patient is eating, and we might make some, some suggestions there. If they feel like they've done everything right, um, one of the things that we're more commonly assessing for now is something called SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth 
or other imbalances in the gut bacteria in general. And we've got these fancy tests now, GI map, GI 360, where you can actually look at um, the, the, the makeup of the, the gut microbiome, which is kind of neat. Um, We'll also assess the patient's motility. So are they more constipated? Do they have diarrhea? Do they have reflux? Like are things moving in the, in the right direction? And so how might we help this? Because this is such a common thing. So first we'll try to start with things such as carminative herbs, if they have a lot of bloating and gas. So these are things like peppermint, chamomile, fennel. These are herbs that are known as carminatives. Carminative just me basically means that they chew up gas. They help to reduce uh, gas production and improve digestibility. Um, we might change their diet as mentioned. Um, we might assess their acid secretion. So some people become hypochlorhydric. They don't have enough acid. Um, sometimes they have too much acid. So we have to figure out ways to, to work with that. If their motility is working, meaning they're, you know, they're, they're more constipated or they're having more reflux, um, or maybe they have diarrhea, we'll, we'll look at different things to help with motility. Uh, one of my go-tos for constipation is magnesium. Works really well to relax the smooth muscle of the bowel and it improves peristalsis, which is the movement of the gut. And we also use um, herbs known as prokinetics, kind of move things around. Um, again, I've already talked about fiber a couple of times. Um, and then dietary changes that might be um, helpful that are that are really specific to what's going on. Um, so if we think a patient has this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, we may consider, like I always test them because I, I feel like if you're starting without a specific test, you don't really know what you're treating. So um, in, in that case, if they are showing positive for that condition, we might put them on the low FODMAP diet, which is a specific um, diet that basically doesn't allow fueling of these imbalanced bacteria in the small bowel. Um, and then we might also identify if there is a trigger food. Some people find post-treatment that they just can't tolerate a food that they used to eat a lot of. A lot of my patients ask about uh, glutamine and collagen and whether that's going to help heal these gap junctions in the, in the bowel. Um, and th this, these are sort of interesting compounds. And I will tell a patient they can use either of these things short term, meaning maybe a couple of months or until their symptoms stabilize. But we don't really understand the long-term effects of either glutamine, which is an amino acid, or collagen, which we all know what collagen is. It's part of um, it's part of connective tissue, and a lot of people want to take it because it improves hair growth and nail growth, and it makes their skin seem younger. Um, but there have been some cell line studies questioning whether both glutamine, the amino acid, or collagen could potentially cause an atypical cell to grow. And so the jury's kind of still out on that. So I don't love long-term hydro supplementation of those two agents. Um, a lot of my patients also ask about probiotics. Should I take a probiotic? Will that help my gut issues? And what I usually say to them is first, let's try fiber and fermented foods, unless they've had historically a lot of antibiotic use or, or an acute use of antibiotics close to the appointment time and when their bowel symptoms really started, um, I'll usually say, let's start with fiber and fermented foods like kefir and sauerkraut and kimchi and all those, if you like those, some people really don't like them, other people love them, so it depends. On, on sort of likes and dislikes there. If they won't eat those, I sometimes will uh, give a probiotic supplement uh, post-treatment. During treatment, um, I might just add, it's probiotics are a bit of a sore spot with um, most pharmacists and most uh, medical oncologists. There's There have been some case reports um, with patients taking live bacteria or even eating uh, live bacteria foods like the fermented foods who have gotten an infection. It is very rare. I've never seen it in clinical practice, but that's why they're often not approved for use during treatment. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on that sort of ties into the GI issues. Some of my patients complain about obviously nausea during treatment, but also sometimes after treatment, some of my patients are plagued with um, nausea post-treatment that lasts for quite a long time. Ginger root 
is probably one of the most well-studied natural agents. It actually works on the same receptor. If you've ever had any of these drugs, Zofran, Kytril, or Aloxy, which are the Ondansetron, that Citron family, ginger root actually works on the same receptor. And the, the nice thing about ginger is you can take it as a tea. Um, you can take the fresh root and you can simmer it down yourself. Um, it comes in capsules, it comes in soft gels. The grab all company makes it in soft gel form now and it, it works pretty quickly and it works very well. Um, so the one thing to note with ginger is that in extremely high doses, so we're talking probably exceeding three grams and most standardized extracts are 500 milligrams. So you could get there if you took, you know, two capsules of a standardized 500 three times a day. Um, but in extremely high doses, it can cause some blood thinning. So we have to be careful in uh, patients who are susceptible to having a bleed or who are on blood thinners um, with high dose ginger. Another thing that's been studied uh, is essential oil therapy. Lemon and peppermint probably have the greatest effect. In fact, even slicing a lemon in half and sniffing it um, has been shown to be somewhat helpful to reduce a treatment associated nausea or prolonged nausea. And one of um, the easiest things that we often will have patients do is acupressure. They can do this themselves. And so during the pandemic, rather than having them come in for acupuncture, we'll often have them get the C bands, which are applied about three finger breadths from the wrist crease. And that's the master point in Chinese medicine for nausea. It's also good for anxiety. So it's, it's kind of a nice, um, nice sort of non-drug, non-supplement treatment that you can do that has proven to be effective um, in randomized controlled trials. So this point's actually quite well studied. We also get asked a ton about cannabinoids. Now, I just wanted to put in a little statement here that we can't prescribe. It's, I mean, you can go to the store, like the, the dispensary and get, get product there, but we can't actually prescribe. Um, what I prefer my patients to do because they're often on a number of medications is I prefer that they go to um, somewhere like, it doesn't have to be, but somewhere like Cannabis Medical Clinic where there's doctors, MDs that do only cannabis prescribing, medically managed pre cannabis pre prescribing, and they um, basically refer you to a licensed producer, which there's a bit more standardization and um, control over the medically supervised um, and licensed producer uh, products. So I often will refer to that. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of my patients say, well, is cannabis oil good? Is it going to help me? Um, I would say it's good because it has low side effect profile if you're not taking a lot of THC, but it also helps with sleep and anxiety. So and appetite. So it's got a lot of, of benefits if patients um, want that as part of their management. Um, another very common complaint, my energy is terrible. I have no energy. And this is, this can be during treatment. This can be post-treatment. Um, normally what I'll do, if it's quite a while after treatment, um, first thing I always do is look at the blood work. So if they're anemic and their oxygen carrying capacity isn't great, that's probably one of the reasons. Um, I always make sure they're eating properly. Um, some people just really aren't. They're just sick of trying to eat things that sit well. They don't know what to eat. They're confused. They're not eating enough protein. They're not eating for energy. Um, I'll often do like something that I refer to as a fatigue panel in the blood work. So I'll look at B12, ferritin, um, especially if they're anemic and a thyroid, I'll do like a TSH thyroid stimulating hormone. And if they have a history of thyroid issues, I might do a full thyroid panel, which is a TSH, a T3 and a T4. Um, if it's been a while since they have blood work at the hospital, I always recheck their CBC just to see if, you know, there's been a sluggish to return to normal counts. That's a very common thing that we see. And then we have actionable things to work with. You know, if there's something that's low, how do we improve it? Right. What do we give? Um, and exercise is another biggie, um, some of my patients are great at exercising throughout their treatment and afterwards, 
Um, some patients never exercised and they started exercising. Pre-COVID, we had all these amazing programs through Wellspring and um, at Toronto Rehab that were really helpful in teaching patients how to exercise that didn't know how to. But there's definitely a bit of a vicious cycle where if we're low energy, we don't want to exercise. And then if we don't exercise, we get more tired and it just sort of goes round and round that way. So try to, trying to get patients outside even walking is, is, is very critical. Uh, we use a lot of adaptogenic herbs, which are these really neat herbs, if you're not familiar with them, that support the adrenal function, but not in an overly stimulating, like it's not anything like taking a steroid. Um, they don't, the ones that we select typically have very little to no effect, well, no effect really, if, if we're using them, especially in a hormone dependent cancer on hormones. Um, but we use these herbs in tea form, in tincture form, or in capsule form to support the adrenal uh, function post-treatment. They're, they're very effective and it's a very nice way to do that because there's really nothing like them in conventional medicine. I wanted to review, um, I know there's probably like a million things that we could go over, but I wanted to review the things that come up the most and the things that are most critical. Vitamin D is sort of top of my list. So vitamin D how much do I take? Common question. We have no idea. We have no idea how much you should take unless we test it because everybody's level is low. You store D and the test to, to consider is called a 25 hydroxy D3. If you have bone loss, osteopenia or osteoporosis, you should be OHIP insured if you do this through your, your GP or through a bone specialist. Um, but there are so many deficiencies noted in so many different primary cancers. And what we're seeing in the majority of cancers is that a better serum 25 hydroxy D leads to better outcomes. So it's very important. So test your D and then we can determine how much you need. Sunnybrook I know does give sort of a blanket dosage of 2000 units a day. Um, they've actually changed the prescription dose to just over 2000 units. So we might be able to get um, higher dose per drop or per soft gel or per tablet in Canada soon. Uh, right now, most of our products are all a thousand units per drop or a thousand per tab or a thousand per soft gel. In the States, you can get 5,000 uh, per. So I'm not sure um, what they're planning to do with that, but there might be a sort of reorganization on that. Um, it's fat soluble. So if you are taking it um, and it's liquid form, you don't have to worry so much about the absorption because they put the fat in there for you. If it's a tablet, you want to take it with food containing a fat always. Otherwise, it's unlikely to be absorbed. I usually have patients check their levels. If they're deficient, we'll supplement them accordingly. And then we might check them again in three months. It's important for a number of reasons, vitamin D. It's important for your bones. We all know that. Um, but it's also important for proper immune function and it prevents atypical cell division. So it's got a lot of functions um, and, and it is really important is, is what we're seeing. More and more uh, research is being done on that. Uh, we see it's more and more important. Um, melatonin is another one that a lot of patients ask about and it also has a multitude of effects. So it's one of our more important blood vessel growth inhibiting supplements. A lot of people see melatonin, they're like, it's for sleep. That's all it's for. Even if I put it into a patient's protocol and labeled as anti-angiogenic or anti-blood vessel growth to tumor cell, um, prevention of bone marrow suppression during treatment, it prevents some treatment related neuropathy. Sure, it does in some cases, but not all, uh, improve sleep quality and quantity. Um, but that's not the main reason we're using it. Although it's sort of a nice side effect and you do have to dose it at bedtime. Um, it also has been shown to be synergistic with some hormone therapies such as tamoxifen. Um, so it may have some impact on some of the hormonal pathways. And one question that I will, before somebody asks it, a lot of people say, is it safe to take melatonin long-term? The answer is probably it is. We do not have any studies showing that our pineal gland, which is the tiny little gland in your brain that makes melatonin, we'll stop producing it if we supplement with it long-term. Could you become dependent on it for sleep? Maybe. Is it better than taking a medication? Probably because it has all those other benefits. So I'll just, I just thought I would answer that before somebody asked it. Um, 
fish oil and omega-3, that's another one um, that gets asked about a lot. And a lot of people are already on one and they bring it in and they show it to me. A lot of the omega-3s are fish oils. There are some vegan options as well that come from algae. Most of us are omega-3 deficient. We don't eat a lot of fish typically. Um, and if you do, there's always the concern with mercury versus omega-3. So there's that. And these are typically purified omega-3 concentrates. And so we know that omega-3s decrease inflammation. This is one of the things that's been studied to help treat or prevent neuropathy. Also very good for brain fog. And there are some studies on that. Um, and if somebody is losing weight, specifically muscle mass, there's some good evidence for omega-3s, specifically fish oils, to help reduce that muscle wasting syndrome. Now we do tell patients that they're taking an omega-3 um, as part of your general health regimen, stop it five to seven days before surgery because it can have a blood thinning effect. So we just want to be mindful of that. Mistletoe is another therapy that we use a lot of in the clinic. Um, when I first started practicing, we used ex exclusively Iskidor, which is from Germany. Um, so is Helixor or Viscosan. That's the same product. Viscosan is made by Helixor. Um, this is a treatment that's been used in Europe for decades upon decades, mostly as an immunomodulator. So like a mild immunotherapy given as a subcutaneous injection three times a week. We would use this in a patient who is on ongoing chemotherapy and having difficulty tolerating their treatment. Um, really the majority of study on mistletoe is on improvement of quality of life, overall quality of life, side effects, symptoms. Um, it does improve the immune system's function to recognize atypical cells. Um, we do not give this therapy with any uh, drug immunotherapies. We have no idea what would happen. Immunotherapies are way too new. This has been around for a long time, but there has been no study to date that that's combined uh, mistletoe therapy as, as our sort of natural, gentle, injectable immunotherapy with the drug immunotherapies like Keytruda or pembrolizumab or nivolumab or any of those newer PD-1, PDL one targeted therapies. So we don't use those together. Um, but in general, this is a powerful natural therapy. Um, we've seen, and it's been well studied just in Europe, not so much in Canada. So we're sort of using their data, um, in terms of improving overall survival time and quality of life. So I thought it was an important, um, uh, treatment to sort of touch on that we use, a, I use this a lot, um, in clinical practice and there have been some studies, um, combining it with chemotherapy and radiation. And I've just sort of summarized, I, I don't have to read all this so you can look at this in the slides afterwards. Um, but there have been some very positive outcomes. Um, just to review quickly what you experience when you get a mistletoe injection, it really doesn't have any systemic adverse reactions, we really see a local red reaction, which is uh, like a mosquito bite. Um, that just means the immune system has been activated and it's awake and it's doing its thing. And um, that was supposed to say a slight increase in body temperature, um, but it's not a noticeable one. So it's not like you've developed a fever with this particular therapy, but we want to see the local red reaction on the skin. That means the immune system has been activated and that's how we determine the patient's dose moving forward. Another treatment that we um, get asked a lot about, um, which is just the hospitals absolutely hate it um, for whatever reason, it's not part of Cancer Care Ontario's uh, sort of box of, of treatments that they would ever suggest. Um, we use this as a supportive therapy really post treatment. Um, we do not combine this with treatment, although on the next slide, you'll see there are some uh, chemotherapeutic agents that it has been studied with. The reason we don't use it so much during treatment is because of the pushback that we get from the hospitals. Um, they do not see high dose vitamin C as anything different than oral vitamin C. And they just see it as a big dose of antioxidants coming into the body um, and, and potentially negating the effect of the chemotherapy. But how this works, and I've summarized it here in one little point, um, vitamin C is very similar to sugar in its structure. And um, there seems to be a sequestering of vitamin C in and around tumor cells 
And generally there's a lot of damage in and around those cells when that happens. The healthy cells are spared and it's because of an enzyme deficiency that cancer cells have um, that this happens. And so I just sort of um, summarize for you here, we don't need to get into sort of the specifics, but I've summarized here how how vitamin C works in high concentrations. And when I say high concentrations, um, I mean 350 to 400 milligrams per deciliter in the blood, which is the equivalent of 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight of vitamin C. So if you take a pill of vitamin C, that's a thousand milligrams, maybe, maybe you might take a few, a few grams or a few thousand milligrams, but we start IV usually at 25 grams, which is 25,000 milligrams. You can't take that orally. You would, you would just be living on the toilet all day. Um, we use this dose because we use the Reardon clinics protocol, which is in, it's sort of affiliated with Kansas university medical center. And, um, this was the dosing approach that they determined could have an effect on atypical cells. Um, it's a safe therapy. We don't see a lot of side effects with it. Although in the literature, you'll see a couple of case reports of kidney stones. If somebody has kidney stones, we have to take that into consideration if it's something that we're considering for them. Um, in general though, I mean, other than thirst and a bit of achiness at the site of the infusion, it doesn't really have a lot of negative side effects. It's a well-tolerated therapy. Um, again, we might consider it in someone who's either finish their therapy or who is getting an ongoing therapy, but not every week. Um, if they're very high risk for recurrence, if they have a lot of inflammation, if they feel extremely fatigued and just crummy after their treatment, we might implement this as an after, um, sort of an aftercare treatment. Um, but certainly not on the same weeks as chemotherapy, despite the studied synergies that were on the previous slide. I guess the cons, I should go over the cons of vitamin C um, and how frequently we give it. We do give it one to two times a week, depending on the case. Um, and I guess the downsides are just the cost uh, and the time to do the infusion. Okay, so we have some time for questions. Yes, we have a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. So are you comfortable to say five extra minutes? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm fine with that. We could do, we could do 10 if you want. Okay. <laughs> so if you all have to leave, that's okay. We understand, but I'm going to try my best to kind of combine some of these. So, so I have kind of a two-part question. So sure. someone's asking, what is the range of fees to see a naturopathic doctor or go to the college clinic? And then in the kind of same um, breath of that, someone's asking, uh, I just want to make sure that they, they might not be able, um, that they can't afford it. What would you suggest? So, okay, so the college program has, um, there's also a sub, so that they get some funding um, from a private source, but they also have, you can fill out um, in their integrative cancer care clinic. Um, they just, they require like a notice of assessment and you fill out a form and the reduced rate, I'm not sure what they have it set at now. They just started a new clinic here, um, but you can go to their website, um, either Robert Shad Naturopathic Clinic or Integrative Cancer Center, the ICC, um, and and you could see you could see um, what that looks like. I'm not sure. In practice, um, it really ranges. Um, I would say like our fees are listed on our website. It's InsightNaturopathic.com. Just click on fees. Um, I would say the lower end of the range for a two hour appointment is probably around two fifty, and the higher end of the range could be up to sort of. 375, 400. And the Great. school is much less, um, I think for reduced rate, less than 50. And if someone can't afford it, is there any other suggestions other than, other than those two that you've just spoken about? Um, I would say the college is probably um, the best program for that. Um, I think there was also a clinic in Maple that did have um, a donor that was providing, I don't know if it was like pro bono care, but it was much reduced or pay what you could. Um, that was the uh, Marsden Center, I, I think, but I'm not sure about that. I think Robert Chad would probably be your best bet. Great, someone's asking, um, you said that the benefit of EGCG and Centra green tea would require drinking a lot of it, um, but then you said it would take, you would drink two cups. Is two cups enough to get the benefit? 
It depends what your, so it depends what your goal is with the EGCG and the primary. So certain cancers have certain, like certain studies that point to specific amounts of milligram dosage of the EGCG. So for general health and in a cancer where it may be beneficial, people who drink green tea may have benefit. Two cups of matcha or sencha is probably going to be enough in like in line with those studies. Um, if you're trying to achieve more of a response, um, you know, in something maybe like chronic uh, CLL, for example, um, where you might want more, um, you, you'd be looking at taking an extract, um, obviously with without um, a concurrent therapy. And if you're going above 800 milligrams of the active catechin, you actually have to monitor liver enzymes because there have been noted cases of um, increased liver function tests with that. Um, so for a lifestyle thing, I would say, yeah, two cups of matcha or essential, you're going to get, especially the matcha, you're going to get a lot of EGCG there. Great. Uh, someone's asking, why isn't naturopathy recognized by regular healthcare system? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, yeah. It's interesting. The head of medical oncology at Sunnybrook, she used to work at Princess Margaret. And she asked me that once when we had a mutual patient at Princess Margaret. And it is frustrating, right? Because you see there's all these allied healthcare workers and we are regulated by Kono, the College of Naturopaths of Ontario. You know, a, it's a regulated health professional. It's, there's, there's absolutely, um, you know, there's no reason for it. I mean, I guess you could argue too, like why don't chiropractors work in hospital? But I feel like, especially with oncology, there's so much more of a critical role for an ND to come in um, and give very careful, advice to patients who are getting treatment at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. clearly there's a huge appetite as we have so many people, you know, tuning in. It's a huge appetite. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, yeah. That's a really good question. Someone just kind of did an FYI and said that um, they've been told not to eat pomegranate because uh, due to food and drug interactions, I just thought, you know, it's great. I think you said this before, like going to a consultation, you know, we, we, we're also individual. Exactly. So the CYP3A4 can be impacted by pomegranate, pomegranate juice, grapefruit or grapefruit juice. So it depends on your drugs always. Um, and sometimes it's more, the, the juice sometimes can be more of a, a detriment because it's concentrated and you're going to impact that pathway, but that's the liver enzyme pathway. So sometimes your medication will even come with a, like on the actual bottle will come with um, that little sticker, the label on there. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone's asking, is vitamin uh, K, MK7, a good and safe supplement to take for cancer patients and survivors? Yeah, and that actually sort of tied into that question um, that somebody had asked about bone pain and fracture um, in myeloma. So yeah, so vitamin K2, so, so MK7 and MK4 are the two main types of vitamin K2. Um, a lot of, you know, it's interesting, like e even in the breast center, you know, where I've worked for quite some time, they're always like, what's vitamin K2? Like they don't, and you, like they give it to baby, like it's weird, they, like it's vitamin K is a known vitamin, but they're just not really familiar with it. K2 is probably more important for bone support and bone health than calcium is. Um, and if there, if there is bone depletion, bone mets, um, um, like fractures as a result of, uh, like pathological fractures as a result of malignancy. Um, K2 is something that I usually will implement as long as they're, and most forms I might say are part MK4 and MK7 here in Canada. Um, most, some are only MK7 and no MK4 in Canada. It's just sort of what Health Canada has decided. Um, we have to just sort of, there's very little risk to increase the chance of developing a clot with this form of K2 and in these doses, like most, um, most products available are 120 micrograms, 100 to 120 micrograms per whatever, four drops, if it's a liquid or a soft gel, um, you're really not risking a clot with, with that sort of dose, but you have to look at what medications a patient's on as well. But, but I would say, yes, there, there is some good um, emerging evidence for K2 in general. Great. Um, someone read that collagen is a, is is a contradicted with cancer. Yeah. So I sort Contra of in contraindication. Sorry. Yeah. So I touch on that a little bit in one of the gut health slides. Um, a lot of patients asking, can I take collagen? I bought this collagen supplement. I want to take it for my hair and my skin and or my gut. Um, and so I'm not um, super keen on recommending it for long term use because we don't know what can happen with 
the, um, we, we don't know how that might, imp like in a Petri dish, it's not looking amazing at this point in time. Um, collagen potentially helping an atypical cell grow. Um, we don't want that to happen. So um, I wouldn't recommend its use. Same with L-glutamine. There's the same similar argument there. So um, they both help with sort of repair, but at the same time, um, I wouldn't recommend it long-term. Someone's saying, um, with the supplements and treatments being costly, what do you re recommend I start to add and include? And I think like, you know, this is just a good kind of thought question, but you know, it sounds, you know, we talk about all these items, but they're so individual that you really need yes. to do it within consultation. Would you agree? Or? Yes. I yeah. try to triage things for patients. So if it's like, you know, let's take breast cancer, for example, and this is super, super general. Okay. But if we were to look at all of the research, we know that when we look at the research, the things that shine for prevention of recurrence, let's say in an ER positive patient, vitamin D, vitamin C, ground flaxseed, and maybe melatonin. And that, and that can vary based on the patient. Okay. But like, there's a lot of other things you can take um, and a lot of dietary things we can do, but I tend to sort of triage things um, in terms of efficacy. What's the research that we have? How good is it? Are we like, if someone comes in and they're like, I'm taking these 15 things because there's 15 cell line studies. So cell line study, for those of you that don't know, it's Petri dish, um, take the cell and expose it to different things. And that's not necessarily what happens in our body. And so unless there's like some pretty good evidence for the use of something, I'm not, I'm never going to push it on a patient. Um, it might not be part of our discussion. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very patient specific, but um, I tend to pull out the most important components. And I think sometimes people think because we can often get supplements, you know, at the drugstore that's yeah. like, it's, you know, but it's still a, it's still a, a, a pill. It's still something that you're taking and, you know, it's not, yeah. So it's, important to, to, to go to a naturopath and have consultation and talk about, you know, how that, yeah. right, seems so accessible. Um, someone's asking, in consultation with a naturopath doctor, is there a difference to the advice provided to two patients, I think kind of answered this, um, that have different cancers, i.e. breast or ovarian? Yes, there should be, again, based on the specific evidence that there is and also where they're at in their treatment, right? So breast cancer patient might be on a hormone therapy or might be having radiation, um, an ovarian, they're, they're, you know, they might be during chemo or post chemo or, it, you know, it's, you've got to sort of look at that too, where they're at in their treatment, but post treatment, you're not going to get a one size fits all. Like here's the, like, I don't have templates for anything. I don't really mm -hmm. believe in that. So it's not just like I copy and paste and give patients the same template. It's always different based on the researchers for the individual primary cancer. Great. Thank you. And I'm just going to say we're 201. So we're going to go a few minutes over to answer some of these questions if people do need to leave. Um, do you provide any, ben uh, do you provide any benefit attending the naturopathic school cancer center in terms of latest research or innovation information other than financially? So is there any benefit of attending the cancer, the, the college rather than an individual naturopath? Um, is there a benefit? Um, other than, I mean, there's two so if you go to that link that I put in one of the early slides on where to find like the Fabno certified NDs, um, which is just really for your information. Again, it's not what the province really suggests, for, but these are people who have the extra education. So there are two, you'll see the list if you click on, it's very small in Canada. There's, there's only like a couple handfuls of us. Um, so there are two of those NDs that have both worked at Cancer Treatment Centers of America in the US. Um, so they do have experience, but again, you're seeing an intern um, for part of the visit. So that's a fourth year student. Uh, they're managed and the treatment protocol has to be approved and partially developed by the supervisor. Um, it's a teaching clinic, right? So I think you sort of get the same sorts of things. Um, there, there aren't really, like to my knowledge at this point, um, they, they aren't doing any clinical trials or um, uh, of their own studies right now that would make it extremely unique. Not, not to my knowledge, but I, I could be wrong on that, but I haven't heard of anything um, as of late. Thank you. Can melatonin levels be tested? Yes, you can test them in the urine. Um, that's the only way there is to test them right now, actually, as a urine metabolite. And so they're part of usually... Um, there's one that you can do through Meridian Valley Labs. Um, we have a sort of a third party called InCommon Laboratories and they have a lab 
on Gervais Drive. And um, but for for urine collections, um, you should just send the patient home with a kit. So yeah, you can test them through urine. Mm -hmm. Are anti-aging supplements like collagen or hyaluronic acid safe? Also, soy and hormone therapy for menopause with estrogen and progesterone positive cancers. Um, so that's sort of, okay. So we sort of talked about the collagen already. So I'm not going to talk about that again. Soy, I had a whole bunch of slides on and I just, it was just, it's, there's so much on soy. Soy in general, in general, big picture, um, for estrogen receptive receptor positive cancers has been deemed safe. Um, the only, and it really should be like non-genetically modified, um, if possible, it's a very genetically modified crop and we don't know what that does. It's really the components, the genistein, the diadzin, the, the isoflavones, those components in soy that really um, are what probably prevent uh, cancers from occurring or primary from, from happening in the first place. Um, the only subset, and this is more specific to breast cancer, of patients there was a little bit of concern um, with more soybean consumption was the HER2 positive subset. Tiny study, eight Korean women with HER2 positive disease that recurred more frequently if they had more soy, but that's sort of the only grouping that um, we know it's, it's possibly detrimental. Um, so that's sort of the story on soy there, but the majority of research shows it's safe and probably helpful. Great. Someone's asking, are naturopathic doctors trained in counseling? One of the greatest benefits I've experienced was just talking. What about massage and touch therapy? Okay, so that is part of the curriculum. Um, and yes, there is a lot of talking and visits and a lot of counseling. I do a ton of counseling. I, it's a lot of like, almost like coaching through, okay, here's what, here's what's happened. Here's what your scan shows. This is what they're recommending. This is why these are the questions you should ask. Um, and in terms of counseling, um, the psychosocial part of everything. Um, I mean, we do a lot of that sort of support as well. There, there's some counseling, but it's not as formal. The training is not as formal as you would get in like a psychotherapy program. Um, but, the, but there is a certain degree of it that happens in the visit. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of the touch therapy and massage? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we are trained in that in the early years. Um, but most NDs don't do uh, massage. They usually refer to massage therapists for that, but, but we are trained in it. Just, I don't know any that use it though. <laughs> Someone's asking, um, can you explain why, uh, in Germany, they use vitamin C with chemo? Um, so more at the integrative centers, same with mistletoe. So the two, like I get asked about mistletoe and IV vitamin C all the time. That's why I included them. You know, there's a lot of things we could have talked about, but those are sort of the two most common things. Um, why do they use it there and not here? And these, it's more in integrative centers, not necessarily the conventional hospitals. So if you were to, you know, equate like PMH or Odette to, some are similar in Germany, they probably wouldn't be using it there, but at these integrative centers, they use it because they see the benefits, right? And those centers, some of them actually use chemotherapy concurrently, as mentioned, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe with respect to some of those studied synergistic combos like gemcitabine, carboplatin, paclitaxel. Now there's a new study out of University of Iowa, which was um, team at all radiotherapy for GBMs. Um, you know, so I would say in this, in the U S too, they're starting to study it a little bit more, but they're just like the Canadian system is very hesitant to let things that aren't, um, standard of care into this, the sort of existing system. Um, the why is, you know, we don't have enough studies. We don't have large enough studies. There's no funding for these things. Um, and for Health Canada to prove something, it really has to be done sort of within country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, someone's asking, how does a homeopath differ from a naturopath? Do homeopaths still have to keep up with ongoing professional development? Um, homeopaths really focus just on homeopathy, right? Which is using... Um, I, are you familiar with homeopathy? Like it's using yeah. very mm -hmm. tiny doses of, um, non-molecular substances, plant, mineral, animal, no, like all different sort of non-molecular substances in potentized form. Um, some practice very constitutionally, which means that, um, 
you know, they're, they're looking at the whole person as an, in, as an individual with all these, you know, complex, complex parts and, and fitting a remedy to them. Um, and so they're just sort of, or, or sometimes they're, you know, like I might use Arnica postoperatively because there's quite a lot of data for that to speed up healing that is technically homeopathic. Mm-hmm. Um, and so some would prescribe based on symptoms or, or just the state of the patient. Um, as a, any regulated health profession um has to maintain continuing ed credits it's just Mm -hmm. i I don't know what their that theirs are um it's a different profession different school okay so i'm going to do two more questions and i i know we have a lot more so i apologize that we can't get to to everything um so uh one of the questions is um can uh, what form of magnesium is best for constipation citrate or oxide Maybe we'll do a fast round. <laughs> uh, can you, what can you tell me about bamboo salt? Sorry, bamboo salt? Mm-hmm. I don't know anything about bamboo salts. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> uh, what about taking biotin after treatment? For hair growth. Okay, so yeah, so a lot of our patients do that. Um, I sometimes, if they feel already like they're just overburdened by supplements, um, we sometimes do a different, um, different treatment, which is topical rosemary oil. And that actually helps quite nicely. Uh, biotin, if you're taking it orally, it needs to be in the 10,000 microgram dose, which is available in, it just doesn't work if it's a lower dose. Great. We'll do one more question. Sure. Um, are there any studies that show that stem cells are being helpful in healing physical and mental effects of cancer? Sorry, I just, you cut out for one second. Sorry. I said, are there any studies that show that stem cells being okay. helpful in healing phys- physical and mental effects of cancer? Um, I'm is like, like using there, there, there are stem cell treatments, but not really, nothing is being done. I would say with that here right now. Um, so, and, and for mental, I would, I would say, I, I don't know any, if it would be used, it would be in a clinical trial, like very, very early stages. Great. Well, thank you so much for such a fruitful presentation. And thank you everybody for all your questions and staying on a few minutes. I wish we could get to all of them, but unfortunately we only have a short amount of time, but I think um, uh, people are saying thank you as well. Just to tell you in the chat box, got a lot of thank you. So we will send the slides. We'll send the recording um, uh, later today or, or earlier tomorrow. And um, I think some of your questions are great and we'll, you have the, um, the uh, links to find a naturopath if you'd like to do further have more time to answer your questions you can also some of the questions you were asking that we didn't get to you can go ask your your healthcare practitioner as well they be they could answer some of them too so lots of thank yous just wanted to put that out there lots of thank yous for that okay thank you so much i hope you have a wonderful day thanks for having me take care bye bye